Hello, and welcome to Replay Value. Mushishi at its core is a painfully human story. Even as it's exploring mystical concepts and creatures, it is fundamentally reflective of humanity's relationship with its surroundings, especially other life, interpersonal relationships, both small one-to-one -one scale and communally, and of course, questions of self. Watching Mushishi is almost like meditating. A single episode is a self-contained story that asks you to reflect on its meaning in the context of your own life. I could likely talk in grand philosophical terms for this entire video, and it wouldn't feel incongruous with the story itself. And yet, Mushishi still feels like an intensely personal, down-to-earth experience. That dichotomy is fascinating, and is the reason why I want to explore what about Mushishi makes it so effective at recreating that meditative ideal. A story that speaks to concepts far beyond the individual's experience, and yet makes it feel attached to one's soul. And we'll be doing so by taking a look at A Sea of Writings, the 20th episode from Mushishi's first season. Structure is one of the foremost reasons for this achievement. Short stories usually make do with a smaller cast of characters and need laser-focused scope on one concept. Otherwise, they're likely to lose their way. A Sea of Writings only features three relevant characters, and in terms of plot, it is the life story of the main character of the episode, Tanyu. Ginko, the Mushishi that serves as the connective thread to the episodic adventures that comprise the series, is, from a purely plot level, almost entirely irrelevant to the episode. But it's telling the story of just one person. The structure of the episode is entirely about Tanyu, and it effectively goes in chronological order because even though we begin with an image of Tanyu, there is no context for it. Tama and Ginko's journey into the storage house is contextually for their relationship and the story to follow. Tanyu is the descendant of a woman who had a destructive Mushi sealed inside her, something that has continued to her descendants, including Tanyu and her leg. When she writes stories about sealing or killing Mushi, as told to her by Mushi Shi, her affliction is drawn out and stored in the paper. The first half of the story is us learning about Tanyu's backstory, beginning with her birth and her early childhood, to her accepting her reality and her first meeting with Ginko. The second half of the story takes place in the present day, as the seals in the paper break and Tanyu recollects the words as though they are bugs and reseals them into new paper, writing more of Ginko's stories and ending with them agreeing to travel together once Tanyu is able to walk. This snapshot into Tanyu's life, where we understand her circumstances by the time we've returned to the present, makes the story personal. We've been with this character since her youngest years, and that allows the audience to easily empathize with her. The desire to just be a normal child, wishing to fight against fate. The development of her not wishing to hear stories about the killing of Mushi when that's all she would hear about from her visitors. How Ginko represented a move away from that, and indicating why that relationship is so important to her. These things are instantly understandable for the audience, and it also asks the audience to question why Tanyu does not despise Mushi even though they're responsible for her circumstances. The person who should hate Mushi more than anyone else should be the person who is most negatively impacted by one. And yet, she doesn't. The answer to that seems to be that a Mushi is a part of her. She too is different from normal people. And that she could not hate herself when Tama seems to love and care for her so much. Tanyu is literally Tama's reason for living and everything she's ever done in her life. Tanyu's writings, those bookworms, are her pets, and in a way, still a part of her. And Ginko, who tells stories of Mushi, animals and humans living together, suggests that Tanyu's personhood is not inherently at odds with itself. That is not to say that she does not wish to be rid of her affliction, but that she does not need to kill parts of herself to be free one day, and that's a beautiful affirmation of self. One of the many possible takeaways from the Sea of Writings is that even the destructive parts of ourselves that hurt us need not be denied as being a part of ourselves, even as we try and move on from them. Mushishi's structure enables a plethora of interpretations from its stories, because even as it provides the context and the hints of answers, it does not spell out what the audience necessarily should take away, instead leaving us to reflect on what the story means to us, to the individual. You can read the story as an allegory for how to handle negativity in one's life. You can read it as a story about how we must preserve our familial or personal history and hold it in high regard. 
Or you can read it as a literal fantastic experience and about a dozen other ways. And in that way, I think the story's ability to tackle these grand philosophical ideas, even as it comes off as the personal story of one girl, is a testament to the way that Mushishi structures an episode. Most of the meditative feeling I get from the story comes from a production level, although the slow pace of the story certainly helps in that regard, another point towards the structure. The sound design of A Sea of Writings is sparse. There's a lot of silence or quiet atmospheric sounds like wind blowing and wood creaking. There is some intensity to the sound design of the show. The opening has a brooding, ominous feel to it, an ephemeral, dark humming. Then when the bookworms escape, the music gets loud, anxious, and excited. And of course, the actual noise they make, sounding like hordes of insects skittering, is all emotive of the fear the audience should feel. The beginning is the unknown. What is the reason for all this writing? What Mushi could be responsible? And then as the bookworms escape, Ginkgo is nervous, scrambling. But notably, the skittering sounds slowly fade as Tanyu takes control of the situation. It is a representation in audio what we learn through the story. By the time that Tanyu begins to place the bookworms back in their parchment, they're no longer the unknown, no longer something to fear and want to destroy simply because they are different. And that unification of writing, literally this fear of difference is a concept that Tanyu makes clear in the opening half, and the evolution in the sound design is amazing. The majority of the soundtrack in this episode contains simple instrumentation and melodies that don't overstay their welcome, and in doing so empower the sense of reflection and serve to highlight the return of the atmospheric noise and especially the silence. Visually, the color palette stays on the darker side, with muted and subdued color choices, matching the melancholic vibe of the story and the music. The elements that will always stick out to me from this episode is how the words are truly like insects, both in their sounds as previously established, but also how they move like ants or centipedes. The way that Tanyu's leg is almost like a store of ink, and how the way she writes is by drawing from it through her body and laying out the words with her hands. It's such a simple and yet brilliant way to show how the writing process slowly removes the Mushi from her body, and is handled so elegantly it's hard not to hold your breath when she places her finger down on the page. Mushishi's A Sea of Writings is a treasure trove of meaning, able to tell the simple story of one girl in a way that leads to questions about the human experience, empowered by its structure and its production. Mushishi is not the kind of story that I think should be marathoned mostly because of how thought-provoking the episodes are. It's the kind of story that deserves your rumination and your reflection, the kind of deliberate anthology that raises new questions for you to consider. The episodic nature, the way it's structured to provide a personal look at its characters, the melancholic tone that is reflected in its visuals and its audio, these speak to how A Sea of Writings, and Mushishi as a whole, is so effective at capturing the viewer's imagination placing them in a position to be asking deeper questions, suggesting answers, and then allowing you to consider your own conclusions as the credits roll. It is a truly beautiful story, and its soul, for all of the fantastical and the otherworldly, is unabashedly human.